Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 183, I chat with C.H. Chi, general manager of DVDO, about wireless HDMI and HDMI switching. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded November 18th, 2013. Episode 183 HDMI Helpers. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus lets you binge on thousands of hit shows anytime, anywhere, on your TV, PC, smartphone, or tablet. Visit HuluPlus.com slash HTG to start your free two-week trial. That's HuluPlus.com slash HTG. And by Ting.com. Ting is a mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting. Pay for what you use. It doesn't require a contract and it offers unlimited devices on one account. To save 25 bucks on your first Ting device, visit htg.ting.com. That's htg.ting.com. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and director of content at avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is C.H. Chi, the general manager of DVDO, uh, and we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about HDMI. Hey, Chi, welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. Glad to be here. Nice to have you here. For those of you who are tuned in live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv, can post questions for Chi as we go along, and I'll pass along as many as I can. So, uh, Chi, DVDO is well known for video processing, uh, you've got two standalone boxes that uh, are available now, the iScan Duo, I think, and the Edge, correct? Yeah, the Edge Green, that's right. Edge Green. So named, I assume, because it's green, uh, <laughs> environmentally well, conscious in some way? We, uh, we made a lower-cost version of, uh, of Edge, the original Edge. Uh, we have a new, newer chip in, in the Edge Green, and it's using lower power, so that's why you call it green. Ah, very good. Uh, and uh, some of the other uh, Twit hosts, uh, Padre SJ in particular, uh, remarked that he remembered seeing DVDO processing embedded in Blu-ray players and such, uh, which I think, is that still true? Yeah, that is still true. Um, some um, AV receivers and Blu-ray players still use uh, DVDO's processing. Uh, DVDO has had a rich history of um, uh, developing technologies. We started about 14 years ago uh, when a bunch of Apple guys uh, made uh, an, um, a video processing chip and system. It was called the iScan Plus. Um, and then we started a company called Anchor Bay Technologies and we developed a lot of the chips where um, the chips are then used inside the DVD box and uh, that uh, video processing is still being used today. Yeah, and it's very good video processing too. I mean, I've seen it in action plenty of times and uh, uh, it's demonstrably really, really good. So congratulations on that. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> Actually, what we're here to talk about is HDMI, uh, a very important subject these days, especially with the recent announcement and finalization of HDMI 2.0, uh, which uh, I've had on the show a couple people, at least one, uh, Mike Heiss, who, who made sure that we knew that HDMI licensing does not want you to call it HDMI 2.0. Uh, have you heard the same thing? They don't really want to use numbers anymore. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because uh, they, they don't encourage using numbers, but they are also forced when they come to a specification to use numbers so people know what the spec is. And that's probably because a lot of people who uh, have used the numbers, uh, even if they comply with one feature of the spec, they would just call it 2.0. So people assume that you know, all the features of the spec, uh, you know, it's available. So you could call your product uh, HDMI 2.0 and only maybe have one of the features out of the four and or, or whatever. And it's yeah. confusing to a lot of users. So they rather just you tell them, tell the user what, what feature you're supporting. But we can't really expect that, can we? I mean, 
people yeah, are going to say hard. 2.0. Yeah, people will use it. That's right. I think all the all the standards body can do is to basically encourage you not to do that. I don't think there'll be a, you know, they can control that. No, I don't think so either, especially for manufacturers who who want consumers to think that they're offering HDMI 2.0. We've seen a number of companies already announce, hey, look, our TV, our, our Ultra HD TV has HDMI 2.0. Yep, and well, you have to dig a little deeper to find out what it means. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what that means. For one thing, it me uh, for one thing it doesn't mean is th there still are no HDMI 2.0 chipsets available, right? Um, at the least in product. Yeah, yes. yeah, at least in product. I mean, Panasonic has announced a TV that has an HDMI 2.0 uh, claims to be HDMI 2.0, I believe. So. I'm assuming that uh, what's in their chip is uh, supports HDMI 2. Some of the HDMI 2.0 features. Um, right. One of the one of the issues really is because even though HDMI 2.0 has been announced, uh, it takes time for silicon to comes out to come out and also for uh, for the products to be tested for HDMI 2.0 compliance. So there's two specs. One is the spec itself, which we can uh, has been announced. Then there's the certification specification, if you will, like, you know, what are you going to test to? And lastly, people have to submit their product to be tested. So that all takes a while. Yeah, exactly. So the parts of HDMI 2.0 that can reside within the 1.4 bandwidth, which is what these chips are, are limited to, I believe 1.4 bandwidth is 10.2 uh, gigabits per second. Is that correct? Um, the the way uh, the way it works out is that um, for HDMI 1.4, the highest bandwidth that is uh, supported is used in terms of clock speed, which is 297 uh, megahertz, mm -hmm. or people just call it 300 megahertz. So, what comes out of the uh, um, each each signal in HDMI is basically a three gigabit per second. I guess you have three of them times. Yeah, it's 10, 10 gigabits. That's correct. Approximately 10 gigabits per second. Right, but uh, an HDMI 2.0 has upped that to, I think, 18. That is correct. But there are no chips that have a clock fast enough to support 18 gigabits per second, right? Not um, yet, anyway, in the, in not, the marketplace. Yeah, not yet. I, mean, I think, again, we don't have enough information from uh, pa the Panasonic TV, at least we have seen it, that uh, it is possible that they have the 600 megahertz uh, chip available, but... Uh, Certainly from Silicon Image, uh, you know, from our point of view, uh, we have not seen in production the 600 megahertz. But I yeah. think uh, one would have to check with Panasonic on the 600 megahertz capability. Now that you, you bring up Silicon Image, and I wanted to make sure people understood because this is a little fuzzy. Yeah. Uh, Silicon Image is, is a company that's related to DVDO. So, um, DVDO is a subsidiary of uh, Silicon Image. About three okay. years ago. What? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Gonna I was going to ask, what, what's that relationship? Tell us, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, about three years ago, Silicon Image acquired Anchor Bay Technologies. Um, and Anchor Bay Technologies created the VRS uh, video processing chips and made the DVDO video processors. So after the acquisition, um, DVDO and, and uh, uh, the VRS chipsets are now part of Silicon Image. Okay. And is Silicon Image then a chip maker? Yes, Silicon Image actually has uh, b uh, several businesses, primarily uh, making chips for HDMI and MHL as well as wireless HD. So primarily a semiconductor company, but it also um, has uh, uh, sells intellectual property, uh, IP products for use by other chip makers. And it also makes systems, um, including DVDO brands as well as um, uh, Simplay uh, test services. So. But the main product right. is chipsets, yes, and chips. Chipsets. And, and you guys haven't made any 600 megahertz HDMI 2.0 chipsets yet, right? Um, stay tuned, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure you're working on it. Yeah. It's not going to announce, but, I believe, yeah. But you haven't really sold any yet, right? Um, well, we, we typically would announce uh, our pro products uh, right before shipping. So since, yeah, it, it's, it's in process basically. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. Uh, hopefully we'll, you'll, you'll have some news at CES and we'll see some stuff at CES. I'm expecting, yeah. that, you know, we'll hopefully. see, we'll see things there. Yeah. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We work very closely with the, the tier, you know, the tier one consumer electronic companies who are essentially, you know, working with us to get HDMI 2.0 chips, um, 
coming out, especially the ones that are really, really fast. So uh, yeah, stay tuned. It's, it's, not, it's coming. Okay. Well, give us an overview of HDMI then. What, what, what do consumers really need to know about it? Um, or, or home theater geeks like us? Well, um, HDMI, I, would, I guess I would start with HDMI 1.4. HDMI 1.4 started with essentially a, um, a several new standards, right? Uh, one was, the, you guys probably remember, when 3D was, uh, was, uh, was the rage, if you will. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was 3D. We remember that, how, that those how, days, not too long how, ago. Yeah. How quickly they forget. Yeah, it wasn't very long ago, was it? Yeah, not, not too long ago. Um, and then it added things like uh, audio return channel. It all, so, you know, the, the way HDMI works is that you, the, the, um, the, uh, the guys who work on the spec always try to make sure that things are backward compatible. So HDMI 1.4 adds on uh, beyond the features of HDMI 1.3. So the, the key features are 3D support, um, upping the, uh, the link from 148 megahertz pixel clock to 297, if you will. Uh, so that you can support 4K24. So 4K24 being, you know, 24 frames per second for film especially. So, um, or 4K25, 4K30. So, mm -hmm. so that's HDMI 1.4. And then um, there's a need for, uh, for higher bandwidth to try and bring out 4K60 uh, at uh, RGB rate. So that's, uh, that's what people are working on right now. And a few other other standards, but uh, other features, but primarily uh, most people are looking towards uh, increasing the, uh, the bandwidth for 2.0. So they just keep adding features. Um, HDMI, 1. HDMI has also grown in terms of its membership, in terms of how they define the spec. Sometime last year, I believe, or uh, yeah, sometime uh, last year, there was um, what's called an HDMI forum where more people were involved in, in defining the spec. So. So, so, so it's, it's evolving, but uh, it's always, always uh, con considering backward compatibility to make sure users are not uh, affected by it. Now, I, I understand that HDMI continues to add features, and now with 2.0, they've increased the bandwidth, clock speed, and the amount of data that can flow down the pipe. But I've heard a lot of people say that even HDMI 2.0 might not be enough for this new Ultra HD, or what some people mistakenly call 4K, uh, especially if we increase the bit depth of the of each color. Right now we're at 8-bit color, and a lot of people would like to go to 10 or 12 or more bits per color. Uh, a wider color gamut, um, higher frame rates, uh, greater dynamic range, uh, which is what the bit depth is. Uh, and a lot of people are claiming that HDMI 2.0 is already being challenged by what that might become. Um, I've heard that too. I've spoken to a few people as well at the, um, at the CDR trade show about needing something more. Um, you know, as a, as a system, as a systems, uh, maker, you know, we, we try to essentially follow the formats. And the only thing I can say is that in consumer, in consumer electronics, especially for like, for example, like Blu-ray, 8-bit um, it, it, has always been used and at, at a very low sampling rate, 4 to 0. Um, and at some point in HDMI's evolution, there's a bit, uh, you know, deep color for more bit depth. And um, with 4K60, it's true that HDMI is limited to... Um, to 8 bit for 444 RGB, for example, or 444 component. But um, uh, in general, I think the expectation with HDMI 2.0 is that you can get a plenty good picture quality uh, at 4K 60 with RGB 444. And if you need to, you can always uh, use uh, higher bit depth with uh, component and subsampling the chroma, which is what uh, is typically used in consumer. So, um, I, I do agree that in some applications, uh, maybe like if you compare with professional standards um, where you have 10-bit um, RGB or 12-bit for that matter, like in the digital cinema, um, there may be a perception that for, uh, that, you know, you need better quality. But I guess um, the folks who, who came out with HDMI 2.0, their, their belief is that it's important to, to uh, increase the clock speed to support um, the features that 2.0 is supporting. 
And, and it's an evolution. Uh, the spec is not sitting still. I believe that they are continuously uh, working on, on providing better performance. Mm. So, what yeah, about, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard that. You've heard the same thing, yeah. yeah. You've probably also then heard uh, a number of people say, why not use DisplayPort, which already has greater bandwidth and uh, I think doesn't charge licensing fees. Yeah, um, you know, DisplayPort is really has been designed uh, primarily for a, um, a, a graphics um, uh, graphics format, and um, bandwidth-wise, you know, display uh, HDMI is essentially with 2.0. I think it's um, it's getting pretty much on par. I don't know the details, unfortunately, about DisplayPort because I haven't been focusing on the, that particular mm. standard. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, HDMI has um, you know that's the fees that HDMI charges for membership, we believe is important for maintaining compatibility, uh, testing, you know, um, and uh, pushing the standard forward. Um, DisplayPort has been successful, especially like in PCs or laptops where they are essentially pushing the uh, um, digital connection to, the, uh, to, to monitors. So there are people who are talking about uh, DisplayPort being better than HDMI. I think what what we are uh, what our position is that we are trying to do our best to get the standards um, the HDMI 2.0 standard out and continue to improve on the standard. Mm -hmm. Untoward in the chat room is asking: Is there a physical difference in the cables between uh, HDMI 1.0, 1.3, 1.4, 2.0, <laughs> all these different version numbers? Uh, this is a question I often get. Uh, yeah, wondering. So, so oh, I need to get a 2.0 ver version cable. Is that um, really thinking we're thinking about? Uh, the um, the spec itself, um, essentially HDMI 2.0 doesn't call for a brand new cable spec to support a higher rate. Uh, essentially, if you if you um, have a cable that is designed for HDMI 1.4, I think they call it the Category 2 cable, a high performance cable that's supported in HDMI 1.4 that cable should work with HDMI 2.0. So that's how they have written and uh, provided the spec. So it mm -hmm. should work just as well. There was a difference in cabling between 1.3 and 1.4 in order yes. to allow um, audio return channel and ethernet over HDMI, I believe, correct? Um, I believe that is true uh, because the audio return channel uses one uh, one pin that is typically not used in HDMI 1.3. So if somebody creates a uh, cable without that physical wire in that cable, um, then it would not work. So um, HDMI 1.4 did use the audio return pin. Mm -hmm. uh, Weird Ami in the chat room is asking, are end users going to notice anything different or, or uh, with regard to the HDMI version of a device? Or is that just for wonks? <laughs> uh, um, well, I think with uh, with HDMI uh, two point oh, um, uh, certainly there are there are a couple of uh, features that uh, that has been added, right? So, if you need more audio channels, if you need um, if you need for four K sixty when when K, uh, when four K sixty sources are available, the one thing I can think of is that uh, when 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 video is captured at sixty hertz, let's say for sports you will certainly notice a difference with a film because a 4K24 is fil film, right? Uh, right. So at a very low frame rate. So if you, if you connect it to a TV and the TV, uh, the TV will have to do two things. One is either um, repeat the frames or interpolate the frames. In either case, it won't look as natural as sports, let's say, as six, or live action at, at 60 hertz. So that's the one immediate thing that I think consumers will notice. Um, mm. The question is, when will you get 4K60 cameras and content? Well, uh, that that re um, I guess I'll let the market figure out. Um, <laughs> so there's a there's a percent. I mean, the, to me, the, the biggest difference is uh, is 24 to 60 and and the um, the uh, the frame rate that the consumers should notice the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, Luis in the chat room is is mentioning that the physical connector of DisplayPort is better than HDMI. Uh, I don't know about that. But they're kind of similar, as I recall. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, the DisplayPort connector. There's two. There's two, I guess. One, one is a bigger connector than HDMI, um, and there's also a mini DisplayPort connector. So um, I've heard, uh, you know, um, 
I, I can't comment on that, I guess. I mean, to me, they look similar. So I'm, I don't have a lot of experience with DisplayPort. Right, right. Well, um, we, we're talking about HDMI here, and we're talking about, we talked about cables, and that leads beautifully into a discussion of wireless HDMI, which again, we can't call it that, <laughs> but <laughs> because we're going to, we're, and we're going to explain that. Uh, Chi, if you'll just hold on for a second, I'd lo love to thank one of our two sponsors uh, for this show, uh, which is uh, Hulu Plus. Now, Hulu Plus is an online streaming service that provides you with tons of content on your just about any device that you have, uh, be it mobile or your uh, streamer or your Blu-ray player, or your TV. Uh, most people are familiar with Hulu.com, which gives you a lot of content on your computer. But if you want to take that content with you on your iPad, for example, um, or into your, uh, into your uh, home theater, I'm just calling up my Hulu Plus uh, app here on my iPad as soon as I tap it correctly. And you can see that, uh, that I have Hulu Plus on my iPad. I can take it wherever I go and watch just tons of television content and movies as well. Um, anytime, anywhere, really. Uh, you can watch your favorite TV shows like Jimmy Kimmel Live, Shark Tank, Family Guy, and Saturday Night Live. I was just watching the Saturday Night Live from last Saturday, in fact, with Lady Gaga. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I can't say I'm a big Lady Gaga fan, but I do respect her. And so I was very interested to see what she did on Saturday Night Live, and it was really pretty cool. You can watch every episode of, of shows like Lost, Doctor Who, Community and Star Trek, which I'm certainly doing. Uh, and they even have exclusive content. You know, uh, Hulu Plus has created shows like The Wrong Mans and Behind the Mask, which I'm looking forward to checking out because it's about, it's about sports team mascots. You know, and if you've ever gone to a game, a you know, football game or something, and you see that, or a basketball game, and you see that mascot running around, what's their life like? I mean, that must be pretty hot in there in that in that outfit. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to checking that one out for sure. Uh, and you also get plenty of access to uh, great, a great collection of ad free content for, uh, for kids for, and, and movies as well. And that's all for only $7.99 a month. Catch up on current shows, binge on old favorites, one of my favorite things to do, or catch a great movie. You know, you can stream as many TV shows and movies as you want, all for that low $7.99 a month. Right now, in fact, you can try Hulu Plus for free for two weeks when you go to huluplus.com slash HTG. Now, that's a special offer for our listeners, so make sure you go to huluplus.com slash HTG so you can get that extended free trial and they know that we sent you. And we thank Hulu Plus very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit network. So we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Hulu Plus. Okay, so we had a great segue into the next topic of conversation, which is wireless HDMI, or what we might call wireless HD. Why can't we call it wireless HDMI, Chi? Well, because, um, because HDMI is... Um it's a wired spec. So I think the HDMI folks, um, uh, they don't want to confuse um, the branding uh, and the application of HDMI. So if you're if you testing for, um, you know, HDMI certification, wireless doesn't make sense because HDMI by definition is, uh, is, uh, is, is wired. Oh, okay. So, so it it's, de by definition, it has a cable involved. That's right. Yeah. That's one cable from a source to a sink, if you will, for HDMI. Right. So, right. so what are the limitations of that cable and w which will lead us into why we need wireless? Well, I mean, a cable in general, a cable is great. Um, it's for short runs, it's low cost. For heavy runs and long distance, you know, cable will attenuate the signal. And, it, and also cable is bulky and very difficult to use if the distance is long. So with HDMI, um, you can probably send a, you know, a, a signal pretty well up to about uh, 20 feet, 30 feet or so. And beyond that, it gets, it gets uh, 
it gets difficult. Um, and because um, the, because and, because the signal attenuates, and yeah, the, the, you lose some, you, you lose the signal quality to some to a certain degree, right? Um, right. Now and it's some, not. Some, so it's not like it's not like analog fall off though, where it starts to degrade a little weirdly. Uh, what I've experienced is you start to see kind of white speckly. Uh, yeah. sparkly kind of stuff going on and then the signal's gone it just disappears yeah it's kind of like uh like things digital right sometimes you are at home you're watching a satellite dish and the weather was terrible you see pixels showing up mm. so with hdmi it's it's more binary in nature so as you see it's speckly and it goes away if the signal is really bad sometimes uh, uh with hdcp content protection um that that may get disrupted you may see snow things like that um and also for a lot of reasons, sometimes you just don't want to have that cable, uh, you know, that you have to string, let's say, from from your source uh, all the way up to your projector. Let's say you have to drill holes in a wall, things like that. So there are applications where wireless is uh, is handy. And there are, if if I'm not mistaken, two different wireless standards for transmitting high definition video. Uh, tell us about both of those. Um. Actually, there's there's uh, there's two major ones, I guess. There's there's more than there's more than two. Um, one certainly is uh, is with space on Wi-Fi. I think uh, your listeners may have heard of a Miracast um, or a push to TV. Let's say some marketing name, Intel or or something called um, Wi-Fi display, Wi-Di, wi wi Wi-Fi display, Wi-Fi Direct, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. in general, it's based on on the Wi-Fi radios uh, signaling. And they're trying to essentially send a, a, a video audio signal from a source to display that way. Um, another another uh, standard, which uh, I think is less popular now, but which was fairly popular some time ago, is called WHDI, which is basically using 5 gigahertz radio. But it is not Wi-Fi specifically, just the radio itself. And it, it, um, it, it does a pretty good job with, uh, with sending wireless. Uh, but that and, the, and that five gigahertz range is which WHDI operates in is uh, more or less the same as Wi-Fi, right? Yes, yes, um, and that's one of the problems is that um, with uh, initially Wi-Fi is at two point four gigahertz, and then now uh, we're running out of bandwidth, so we are going for the uh, five gigahertz bandwidth as well, a radio as well. So that's why um, we use. Uh, wireless HD standard, uh, which is based on a 60 gigahertz radio. So that is a lot higher than, than 5 gigahertz radio. And as a result, uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have problems with interference, for example, from Wi-Fi. Right. That would, that would seem to me to be the big problem with uh, WHDI and these other Wi-Fi-based formats is interference with other traffic in the same radio frequency band. I would think that would be the that would be the biggest uh, benefit of using something like 60 gigahertz is that uh, you don't have uh, to worry about um, interference from from Wi-Fi at least not in the near future. Um, right. Yeah. So so DVDO ha actually makes a product that uses this wireless HD 60 gigahertz uh, wireless HD. <laughs> it was a good name for it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoever came up with that was very good. Uh, called the Air. I think you're in your third generation, right? That's right. We we call uh, we first came out with the Air uh, in around May of last year, and we just uh, and we have re uh, essentially have a new product that we announced at Cedia called the Air Three. There's no really Air Two because we the, our chipset skipped the generation to the third generation. And uh, okay. so we just said, well, three just means three. Uh, the, the, we came up with three for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, is the third generation of our chipset. And second is that it has three, it supports three interfaces. So the transmitter can accept uh, HDMI, uh, DVI, and also our new mobile standard called MHL. So uh, any three of those can be connected to the transmitter and it will send a signal to the display. Ah, okay. Now we saw a picture a moment ago, and I just wanted to make sure everybody uh, saw that. Uh, basically, what wireless HD, the DVDO Air, as an example, uh, you connect the transmitter by a hard, hardwired, uh, uh, sorry, HDMI cable, a short one presumably, yes. to the transmitter, and then it transmits wirelessly to the receiver, uh, which is connected by a an HDMI cable, again a short one. 
presumably, to, say, your TV. And then that eliminates having to connect a wire directly from the source to the display. That's right. So you would typically uh, place all your sources in, a, in an area. Uh, you can basically have your AVR as well connected to a bunch of sources. And then the AVR also can be connected to the Air 3's transmitter. And then you can place your receiver uh, next to the projector or next to a TV. And this is handy if you really don't want to, um, uh, don't want to, to have to string a long cable uh, to a projector, let's say. Um, that we have a lot of inquiries from churches, hospitals, uh, universities, and uh, home theater where they really don't want to have a long cable to go between the display and, the re and their sources. Mm. So what is the range then of the air at 60 gigahertz as compared to, uh, say, the WHDI at 5 gigahertz? For 60 gigahertz, our range that we uh, that we would guarantee, if you will, for lack of a better term, is that um, it would be 10 meters or 33 feet or so, 35 feet or so, but uh, it can go a lot longer. It all depends on the configuration. Um, during uh, Cydia, we actually, uh, it was really fun, we connected our transmitter to the output of the uh, DISH network booth and then uh, uh, and the, uh, to the output of DISH network uh, uh, receiver, if you will, uh, in a booth, and then right across the aisle, we connected to a digital projection projector, and we measured that to be 68 feet or so. So mm. it could be two or three times more than what we say because we are being more conservative. And the main reason for that is that if you have a line of sight and you have a, uh, and your room is structured so that the signal can uh, can can be, uh, if you if you will, virtually pointed between a transmitter and a receiver, then then you can go pretty far. And uh, the 60 gigahertz signal also bounces uh, bounces off walls, so you know it. Uh, you don't have to have strictly line of sight, but there'll be some attenuation when the, when the signal bounces off the wall. So, so in general, you know, we say it depends, but uh, easily uh, 35 feet or so. Yeah, this is one of the things I've heard about um, wireless HD, the 60 gigahertz system, is that if somebody it, at such short um, high frequencies and short wavelengths, um, if somebody walks between the transmitter and the receiver, they can actually block the signal. Um, that is actually true. Depends on how uh, it was implemented. Early versions of uh, wireless HD uh, adapter sets are somewhat susceptible to interference when somebody walks past. Um, our latest generation, uh, the Gen 3, is actually quite flexible. I mean, if you were to put your hand over the transmitter and receiver and literally try to block the signal, then the signal wouldn't pass. But if you were just to stand in front of it, but that's um, there's enough room around you or, and walls as well, the signal will literally bounce off the walls and the receiver will pick up on the signal. And because, uh, you know, we, um, we the receiver and transmitter constantly talk to each other. And if the main path is blocked, then you'll find another path to, to, uh, to capture the signal. Mm. Uh, some of these guys, I guess, use terms like beam steering to be able to effectively steer the beam to, uh, from mm -hmm. one, one point to the other. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of paths for the signal to go, and it, it always c continuously tries to pick the best signal path it can. So, um, the, yeah, it's quite robust, actually. Uh, now, but the 5 gigahertz uh, system, the WHDI, we'll just stick with that for now, Sure. Uh, doesn't really have that. Um, concern, does it? I mean, you can walk between the receiver and the transmitter and it, it won't disrupt the signal. Not only that, 5 gigahertz can potentially, anyway, actually go from one room to another. Yes, the 5 gigahertz signal will go. So it's quite good for multi-room application. Yep. Um, you know, the, the way I would say it is that for, you know, for those, for people who who want to use a wireless technology and have it to be as close to a cable performance as the as uh, as possible? Wireless HD is a really good fit within the constraint of a single room or a single you know conference room or a large area. Whereas if you need multiple uh, multiple room application and uh, um, less physical interference, if you will, then the the wireless technology that's based on five gigahertz would be a better better fit. Mm -hmm. So, which is why the trade show, for example, I mean, the, the reason why I, I like to use the, the term a cable replacement or at least as close to cable performance is that we kind of take cables for granted. 
um, you know, cables give you the best signal, if you will. I mean, a really good cable, the signal is perfect, right? Uh, yeah. Cables don't have be- uh, the delay is not not really noticeable, if you will, through a cable. Um, and uh, and, you know, and the um, uh, and it has no interference, right? Once you have a cable, you're done. So the wireless technology, if you want, really has to try to to measure up to what a cable can do. And as far as wireless HD or 60 gigahertz technology is concerned, quality isn't an issue because you have a lot of bandwidth. So that's not a problem with uh, four gigabits per second. Um, interference is not really an issue for us as we talked about earlier. And lastly, latency or delay is really not an issue as well because we don't do a lot of, uh, we don't do any processing like a- compressing and decompressing, if you will, uh, within the, uh, uh, within the uh, four gigabits per second because you have so much bandwidth. So that's why during uh, we showcase uh, gaming, uh, playing like PS3 game, if you will, at the trade show, because at the trade show, got all these radios uh, going around. And, um, and we are not affected by the, uh, by the interference from Wi-Fi. And gaming is like the most uh, strenuous test for, uh, for a video, if you will, because... Certainly for latency. That's right. Yes, right. That's why you can't play the game. So we did that at the show. Um, I think just to illustrate that, we are as close as you can get to a cable performance for, for wireless. So I think it, now, it, it depends on the use case, depends on what people want. Sure, sure. Now, you said that, that your transmission system carries 4 gigabits per second? So, um, wireless but HDMI HD, is 10. <laughs> a ca- cable, I mean. Yeah, HDMI cable has 10, and HDMI is moving ahead. So wireless is, if you will, a little bit behind in terms of uh, trying to do things that a wired or wide HDMI can do. So on the wireless HD side... What we have is um, our implementation anyway. We have two channels of, uh, of wireless HD, meaning that you can actually use two Air 3s at the same time in the same room. Uh, each one of them will just will use one channel. Each channel is 4 gigabit per second. So basically we have a total of 8 gigabit per second. Or, you know, um, but that requires you, you to use two transmitters? You, that's right. So, so t- it, it will be possible... To try and send, to try and send higher than four gigabits per second, but we need two, and that's something that you know we, at this point, we are certainly working on ways to figure uh, ways to send higher bandwidth over wireless. But Air three at this point supports effectively a 1080p 60 um, a connection, for for its highest resolution. Okay, 1080p 60. Uh, 3D seven point channel audio, high bit rate. You know, it's like assume Blu-ray, if you will. Right. Um, so I've got a question in the chat room. Taylor Karras is asking, uh, does sure. wireless HDMI support, uh, or wireless HD rather, support uh, HDMI 2.0 or 4K? Um, wireless HD, uh, what, the, the way it's implemented right now, does not support 4K. It just does not have the bandwidth to support uh, 300 megahertz. So it's currently limited to 1080p 60, 3D, and 7.1 HD audio. Mm-hmm. We are working towards, uh, we're figuring out how to support, how to catch up to HDMI. <laughs> uh, so I guess, are you saying that if you can support full HDMI, uh, full uh, 1080p, 60, 3D, 7.1 audio, are you saying that, that when that goes down an HDMI cable, it's not using any more than 4 gigabits per second? Um, on the cable side of things, you know, um, at 4 gigabit per second, 1080p, 68-bit, I believe, is sufficient to send the data. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you use um, if you use 10-bit or 12-bit, uh, we won't be able to support it. So we're right. limited I mean, to 24-bit. Blu-ray, yeah. Blu-rays are 8-bit. So let's say 8-bit, mm-hmm. um, uh, 1080p, 60 with 7.1 audio, uh, I guess doesn't require the entire bandwidth of HDMI to be transmitted. No, Even down not. a cable. No, that's not. Yeah, okay. Um, so so your wireless uh, HD system, the Air 3D, can handle that no problem. But if you need more than that, which you would with uh, 4K of any sort or anything right. else that requires more bandwidth, higher bit depth or so on, then, then you know, we're talking the next generation. As you say, yes, you're playing a bit of catch up with the cables. <laughs> right. We're catching up to HDMI. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you mentioned a moment ago about the different 
um, inputs into the transmitter. You have HDMI, you have DVI, which is the video only version, kind of a previous version of HDMI that only carries video, no audio. Right. Right. And then MHL. And That's I wanted right. you to explain that to, to what everybody, to everybody what it is. Sure. Uh, MHL is a, um, is a s connection uh, standard, if you will, uh, that we have designed to target uh, mobile devices. So anybody with a Galaxy S3, S4, or any Android, higher-end Android phones, if you will, uh, most likely will have MHL embedded in it. And um, the MHL uh, interface allows the phone to connect to a MHL TV, and what hap with the difference with, uh, with, I think the best way to describe is, is just to compare and contrast with HDMI. So with an MHL phone, you, you have a cable that you connect to the TV. And the, if the TV is MHL enabled, like uh, I think most Sony TVs are today, uh, it will actually charge your phone. So power flows from the TV to the phone. It keeps your phone charged. You can send um, essentially up to essentially high def video and audio to your TV. And last but not least, um, we all have also defined what's called RCP, Remote Control Protocol, so that your TV can, you can use your TV's remote to control your phone. So imagine hmm. you, you plug your phone into your TV, um, you sit on your couch, and, and now you switch input from your, uh, on your TV to the phone. You see the phone, you know, Android phone interface in front of you. And now you can navigate the Android interface with your MHL TV's remote. So that's the idea. Uh, and so the idea then is that you can do whatever you normally do on your phone on a bigger screen uh, without draining your phone's battery. In fact, it's actually getting charged. And uh, you, can, you don't have to uh, step up to your phone to interface with it. You can use your, your TV's remote. So that's really the, the, uh, the basics of MHL. Now, is the MHL connector any different from HDMI? So this is the part where it gets uh, a little confusing. Um, MHL <laughs> spec itself does not specify a dedicated connector. In fact, one, oh. of, the reasons, one of the reasons why um, the cell phone guys uh, really wanted to use MHL is that um, the, the MHL uh, reuses the, uh, the, the USB connector on, on the Android phone. So you effectively, you don't have to create another connector, and connectors are a big deal on phones. So previously, if, your phone want, if you want to send you know, like 1080p audio video to your TV uh, with a phone, you need a micro HDMI connector or a tiny one, and they are not very reliable um, uh, because of, you know, pins dens uh, pin density. So, so what, we, what the phones do now with MHL is that on a five pin, if you will, micro USB connector, the phones are smart enough. The phone essentially talk to the TV and they basically switch into MHL mode and the phone is uh, effectively disconnect the USB portion and uses the five pins for MHL. And on the TV side, um, the TV just uses the, MHL, uh, the HDMI connector on the TV side. And when they handshake, they, they flipped into MHL mode. I gotcha. Yep. Well, I've certainly seen MHL becoming, and by the way, MHL stands for Mobile High Definition Link, I think. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Just want to make sure everybody understood that. Make sure I got it right, too. <coughs> I think um, I got it right, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've, I've started to see uh, MHL pop up here and there. A lot of TVs and AV receivers, in fact, say that yep. they now have an, an MHL input. Uh, the Roku streaming stick, for example, plugs That's into right. an H, an H, an MHL input, and uh, it charges. You know, derives its power from that, and and does its wireless streaming uh, into that kind of input. So I think it is something we're going to see more of in the future. And uh, the Air Three transmitter has uh, such an input on it, so that you could in fact connect your mobile phone to the Air 3, and have that transmit wirelessly to the TV. Right. So just want to make it clear that we actually, the Air 3 actually only has one connector uh, as a, um, the idea as is MHL. that it's, uh, it has a connector. It, it oh, looks just like one an connector. HDMI, just one connector. It looks like an HDMI connector. And um, it will just be smart enough to figure out whether it's DVI or HDMI or, um, or uh, MHL for that matter. I uh, gotcha. Okay. Right. So the idea there is to basically replace a cable. So, so certainly we've gotten a lot of feedback from our customers that you know they would like to get more um, c 
connectors to the air. And that's something that I'm looking at pretty closely. Okay. But in the meantime, <clears throat> uh, DVDO actually does offer something uh, to address the issue of multiple connectors and how fortunate it is and how timely that uh, that becomes our next point of conversation right after I thank our second ep uh, sponsor for this episode, which is Ting. Now, Ting is the, a mobile phone service. They're a reseller of the uh, Sprint network, uh, but, they, but it's a pretty special thing. It's really not uh, your average everyday cell phone service. There are no contracts and no early termination fees. It's contract free. And, and they even have an ETF or early termination fee relief program. If you're gonna, if you're gonna pay an ETF to transfer over to Ting, they've got your back. They will give you a credit for up to 25% of your, uh, for 25% of your ETF up to $75 per device. All you have to do is purchase your device through Ting, port your number over, submit your final bill with your ETF detailed from your previous carrier, and uh, and they will take care of it up to 75 bucks. Go to ting.com slash ETF for more information on that. Now, there's no bundling or ride-along services. Rates range from XS to XSL, uh, XXL service levels for voice minutes, text messages, and megabytes of data all billed separately. That's really important. There are no overage charges or penalties. You get charged just for what you use. If you have a heavier month with Ting, just pay for what you used. No add-on charges. You get voicemail, caller ID, tethering, hotspot, three-way calling, call forwarding, and other features are all part of the service. And there are no mysterious line items on your bill. Ting charges you for what you use plus whatever taxes they're legally required to collect. <coughs> No hidden charges or recovery fees uh, at all with Ting. Uh, you can even have unlimited devices on one plan, which is really cool uh, because you're sharing pooled minutes, messages, and megabytes. Each device on the plan costs a flat six bucks a month. And there's even an, a powerful online account control panel, which lets you take control of your account, lets you look at your usage and bills. And there's even a no-hold customer support. Dig this. Call them at 855-TING-FTW anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and a real person will pick up the phone. How often does that happen? Certainly not often enough in my book, but it will at TING. They also offer great online support as well at help.ting.com with uh, active customer forums, a simple and powerful help ticketing system, video tutorials, startup guides, and much, much more. First, you purchase your mobile device from Ting, which you'll receive in two to five business days. Then you activi activate your device with Ting and have the option to select a new phone number or port an existing one. Ting will break your rates out by minutes, text messages, and megabytes and bill you at the end of the month for what you've used. So visit Ting today at htg.ting.com. Save money and better manage your mobile phone usage with Ting. Check out their savings calculator and see how much you or your company can save. Home Theater Geeks viewers also save 25 bucks on your first Ting device when you sign up. So visit htg.ting.com and start saving today. And we thank Ting very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit network. Okay, so... Um, we were talking about the fact that the Air has one input... HDMI input that'll, that'll accept HDMI or DVI or MHL. But what if you've got a bunch of HDMI devices? Maybe you don't even have enough uh, HDMI inputs on your TV or your AV receiver. Or say if your AV receiver is old enough, it might not have any at all. So uh, fortunately, <laughs> DVDO offers a great solution to that problem as well. Um, and uh, Chi, why don't you tell us about it? So in our Wired products, we have um, our video processors, the iScan Duo and the, and the Edge Green, which can take, uh, the Duo has eight HDMI inputs, uh, Edge Green has five, and we also have two uh, 4K video switching products. One is called the Quick 6 and the other one is Matrix 6. Each one of them have six HDMI inputs. Um, and the, uh, the Matrix 6 and Quick 6, two of the HDMI inputs are also MHL capable. 
So you can easily, very easily connect, if you will, um, multiple sources to uh, to a matrix six. Uh, um, Scott showing it on the screen, and then one of the outputs can easily be connected to the Air threes to provide a wireless connection to one of the TVs that you have to your projector, for example. So right. um, these wired products uh, work very well as a, uh, with the Air three. Add three being, if you will, the accessory to connect to the switching products. Now, what's important about the, the Matrix Six is a matrix switcher, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. So the um, what, what we basically what is that? why why is it important? So matrix switching um, allows you to essentially have just one uh, one set of equipment a place somewhere, uh, in, for example, in a main room, and um, and when you connect you can connect your two displays uh, to the matrix switcher and each display will switch independently. So um, you may hear the term zone one, zone two, sometimes being used or multi-zone. Effectively, we, the way we think of it is that we have a, you know, two displays, display one and display two, or main display. And uh, you can independently select inputs on each display. So you don't have to duplicate your, your equipment and just have one. So it's pretty handy. For some I, applications. I, the application that I think of immediately when I think of a matrix switcher, and by the way, the matrix six is technically known as a six by two matrix right. switcher. It has six inputs and two outputs. Um, and that is if you have in your home theater a projector on a drop down screen firing onto a retractable screen, and you have like a plasma or an LED TV behind it, so that when it's bright, it's during the day, the windows are open, the kids are playing in the corner, whatever, uh, or you've got a Super Bowl party and a bunch of people are around, you can retract that screen and watch the LCD display, LED display now, which will be much brighter. Um, but then when you want to watch a movie at night, you want to have a more cinematic experience, you drop down that screen and you play the projector. And the ability with a matrix switcher to send any input to either output, or in the case of some sw switchers, many more outputs, just being able to kind of route whatever you want, wherever you want, uh, seems like uh, an ideal situation for such a, a theater that has two displays like that. Yeah, so theaters on two displays, in fact, uh, our other product, Quick6, will also do what you, you were suggesting, which is one or the other. Um, the matrix switcher adds another... Uh, feature which is one or the other simultaneously so say you have a main room main theater room and uh, you have a big display there and then you have a secondary room where you want to also watch somebody wants to watch another uh, some other content somewhere there and you can do it at the same time so say uh, right of course of course so the the application i'm thinking of the quick six would work just fine because you're not going to watch them both at the same time both simultaneously that's correct yeah all right so uh, but, so that go ahead I was going to say, I was going to say then, but then that brings up the question of how do you route HDMI to another room? Uh, you, right. you can't probably run a cable that long. The Air 3 won't transmit into another room. That's, so how that's you a good question. So, you know, for, for the second room, um, there's a couple of ways to do that. You certainly wouldn't use an Air because uh, it will not go through the, the wall. Um, you can have a long HDMI cable that goes um, perhaps... Uh, um, 20, 30 feet or so, but those are unwieldy. Um, so another approach is to use HD base T, which is um, an, an HDMI extender technology, for example. So, or ba balance, which is effectively connecting uh, HDMI to a uh, uh, adapter that converts it into a 10 base T cabling, and some homes have those wiring. Ah, yes, okay. So a balun, B-A-L-U-N, which is short for balanced unbalanced i think yeah balanced unbalanced i believe yeah not not means. unlike the term modem for modulator demodulator or codec for coder decoder uh, right. they all basically have a similar meaning which is that they convert something into something else and then unconvert it or convert it back right exactly right. so if you take uh, in, in, interestingly, I think in, a balance work kind of like the air or wireless HD in that you connect a, a, an HDMI cable to a ballon that converts it into, say, Cat5, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, I've even heard of some that use fiber optics. Could which be, you yes. Can, which you could run hundreds of feet. 
Fiber uh, will work quite well for, for very long runs. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. And then at the other end, you've got another ballon that converts it back into HDMI, and that connects to your second TV. So for this multi-room or multi-zone application, that's really what you're talking about, isn't it? Is having to either use a ballon system or... Some people use HD-based T these days. HD-based T. Yeah, that's the standard. And, and, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, tell us a little bit about HD-based T, because that's pretty cool. Um... So HD based T is a is a standard that's a, I think the semiconductor company is called Valens V A L E N S semiconductor, and um, they basically do um, essentially like uh, what you were saying, Scott, is that they just essentially convert HDMI into a, a signaling that runs off a uh, Cat five plus or Cat six cable, and then uh, on their transmit side and on the receiver side they convert it back. I think the one of the advantages that they have over over uh, a, a balance is that um, the techno it's it's more reliable, um, and I believe there's a lot of digital processing that goes in there. Uh, I'm not uh, super familiar with the standard, except for the high level uh, use case where you can effectively send a 1080p signal for up to 70 meters or so, or maybe even up to 100 meters, depending on the uh, the, the models that that you use. So they're very popular in the uh, in the CDA channel, uh, I believe, at this point. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, isn't HD base T also being? I think it's being implemented uh, on certain products within certain products. It's it's either Onkyo or Pioneer receivers. I think now have them. Yeah, some. Uh, uh, I I visited the uh, Valence booth, the HD base T booth at CDA, and some mm -hmm. they they showcase some uh, a couple of AV receivers and a couple of TVs and projectors that have the receiver built in. So you basically have a um, so they also design it so that it's a, like an Ethernet pass through. So you have essentially a projector that has an Ethernet connector, and um, the Ethernet connector basically can be used for HD base T. Ah, okay. Any plans to put uh, HD base T into the Quick Six or um, or Matrix Six or even Air? Um, we it's something that uh, I'm talking to some folks about. Um, the I think uh, for a Quick Six and Matrix Six are meant to uh, Matrix Six especially is really meant to be a lower cost uh, matrix switcher for smaller room installation. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, I think, a possibility that if we build um, a, a larger system with more outputs, let's say, for, for truly a multi-room application, there may be a use case where you may want to have, say, maybe two, one or two HDMI outputs and the other two could be HD based T. So we are, we are, we are looking pretty closely with the, uh, the guys on Valence to see how we can do this uh, effect, uh, cost effectively and in a, in a timely manner. Um, mm -hmm. the, the one thing that, that, is, um, that we need to spend more time um, thinking about is is that you know that's the HDMI 2.0 support and everything else, and that takes a bit more uh, work to, mm -hmm. to make sure that I don't develop too many products too quickly, if you will. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to you don't want to spread yourself too thin there. Yeah, uh, exactly. I know I, I know I've gotten um, a couple questions in the chat room. I can't find them right at the moment, but uh, tell us what the uh, MSRP, the cost, the list price of the. Uh, the Air 3 system and the Matrix 6 and the Quick 6 for that matter? Sure. So uh, Quick 6 retails at $399 and the uh, Matrix 6 will retail at $499 and the Air 3 is $199. So $199, $200 $200 for a cable replacement, um, which eliminates the need to run long cables and, and all that jazz within one room. And we want, I want to make sure everybody understands that, that right. the Air 3 is meant to be within a single room as opposed to moving through walls, which you've said it can't do. And that, that's okay. That's what you've designed it to, to be is something for within a single room. Correct. <clears throat> um, Weird Ami in the chat room is asking, what does DVDO stand for? Oh boy! I mean, I was one of the co-founders of DVDO in '97, and we were sitting around a room trying to figure out. At that time, if you '97, that's 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 a while ago. Um, at that time, yeah. I don't know if your listeners remember. That's when DVD just started. The DVD format just uh, mm. was being defined. So we were just playing around with DVD and digital video, and uh, eventually we decided that digital video and DVD together is DVDO. But one of my colleagues uh, thought it would just be fun to just call it digital video done outrageously. So that's, that's <laughs> to call it that. 
<laughs> ah, very good. I'm glad you came up with that. That's really good. <laughs> Digital video done outrageously. I will that's remember what, that. That's how we. That's how we eventually. I, I guess the genesis is not that, but somebody fitted the. The tagline, digital video down outrageously to DVD. Came up with that later, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, one last question. We're, we're out of time almost here. Does uh, DVD video processing, I don't want to get back to video processing here for a second. Does that, uh, do you have yet upscaling to 4K or UHD? Um, yes, we do. Um, at, uh, at CDA, we showcase our 4K scaler. Um, that would uh, use that use our latest uh, video scaling algorithm that can actually detect whether the uh, content is video or graphics. So uh, right now when we scale video, a lot of uh, scalers we just focus on video scaling, which does a fantastic job with video. But when the content is mixed in with graphics, the graphics uh, doesn't look as good. So we have come up with an adap adaptive video scaling algorithm and um, we'll be, um, you know, we showcase a prototype of a box that converts uh, pretty much, uh, you know, any resolution to 4K and uh, we who are hoping to product productize it very soon. Mm -hmm. Taylor Karras in the chat room is asking a related question, which is, isn't it true that when things are upscaled, they lose detail? How do you manage to solve this problem when developing the chip um, or the, al the algorithms more precisely? Yeah, so it's very difficult. Uh, your listener is, uh, the question is, is right on. Um, when you don't have the detail, it's uh, impossible to, to create a detail from, from the air. So you do your best to extrapolate the, the missing pixel when you, when you, um, uh, when you uh, scale up, if you will, cause, because you have to uh, create new pixels. So you, you use an algorithm to, to calculate the approximate pixel location. And then what you do is... Um, and it will create, um, it will inevitably make the picture look a little soft because you are essentially averaging. So we have a variety of uh, enhancement, if you will, a processing, post-processing after the scaler um, to, to sharpen the image, um, to try to bring back more detail. So, but uh, technically speaking though, you can never create detail that's not there. You can only do your best, uh, do your best guess. But I can right. tell you, though, that uh, we have done demos with the Blu-ray 1080p upscale to 4K using our scaler, and uh, we don't even need that much enhancement. It looks, it looks pretty good, I would say. Well, I look forward to seeing it. Um, sure. And uh, anything else that uh, DVDO comes up with, because uh, you guys always come up with really great stuff. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Scott. Take care. You bet. Uh, you can find out all about DVDO products at uh, dvdo.com. You can find me at avsforum.com. And you can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott, also at avsforum. And you can also find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here on twit.tv slash htg. And on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit. Home Theater Geeks. Next week, I've got two guest geeks lined up, Marty Humphrey and Chris uh, Jacobson, both re-recording engineers at The Dub Stage, a post-production house here in Los Angeles. And uh, they've got one, they've got a, a sound system there from a company called Oro, which is a three-dimensional sound field system currently for commercial cinema, but uh, soon we think to be possibly available at home. Uh, it's a direct competitor to Dolby Atmos. And uh, I heard my first really good demo of it and it sounded really good. So uh, they're gonna be on to talk all about Oro and what it means and how it works and what to expect in the future. So I do hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out.